Uh, let's talk a little bit about carboxylic acid. So we're in the final chapter, and, and, and as I was uh, mentioning, this functional group is so important for a lot of different uh, molecules and types of chemistry, from materials and plastics and, and synthetic fibers to biological molecules. Uh, and it's the carboxylic acid functional group which makes this, uh, uh, these molecules actually give a lot of different properties to them. So remind you, a carboxylic acid has a carbonyl group in it as well as um, an OH group. And because of the carbonyl uh, polarization, um, that hydrogen is somewhat acidic. That's why they're called acids. They can be decarbonated with relatively weak bases. The pKa's are much lower than water or alcohols. Uh, and at the same time, they have reactivity in that the oxygen has significant negative charge, um, and the carbon of that carbonyl has electrophilic character as well, it's positive charge. Now, if we think about doing reactions with carboxylic acids, uh, one of the difficulties with trying to do chemistry with it is that that hydrogen is acidic. And so that often interferes. If you have like some kind of a strong nucleophile, and you can imagine taking a nucleophile that we've talked about adding to aldehydes and ketones and esters and other functional groups. So that's a carboxylic acid group we'll talk about. But if you think about reacting, um, say, a Grignard reagent, If you were to take a Grignard reagent and react it with a carboxylic acid, what would you expect to happen? This is a negatively charged species. This, think about that as a CH3 minus. Okay? The carboxylic acid has essentially two electrophilic sites, right? Obviously, the, the carbonyl carbon, like we talk about with aldehydes and ketones, that has a partially positive charge, and we add nucleophiles to that carbon, right? Um, however, when you have the acid functionality, that hydrogen is actually the most positively charged part. The hydrogen is acidic. So what happens if you take a Grignard reagent and react it with a carboxylic acid is you'll simply deprotonate the acid. The Grignard reagent will be a base. Okay, so for a carboxylic acid, the first kind of reaction is that it reacts as an acid, typically. So what would be the byproduct of that, or the, the products resulting from that reaction? CH3 minus takes the proton. What do you form? CH4, right, CH4. Methane. Methane is essentially inert now. CH4, and then you'll make the alkox, uh, sorry, the, uh, the negatively charged acetate ion from, say, acetic acid, okay, which will be associated with the magnesium salt. So one of the difficulties in trying to do chemistry with carboxylic acids is that acidic nature of the proton um, is the dominant feature with the carboxylic acid itself. So if we really want to do chemistry with the carboxylic acid, we need to think about using other carboxylic acid derivatives where we don't have that acidic proton. Uh, and then we can think about doing other kinds of chemistry. And so we introduced these functional groups last time. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned here that some are more reactive and some are less reactive. And when I'm talking about the reactivity, I'm talking about reactions of the carbonyl carbon. Okay. Because they don't have the OH group, the acidic proton, um, something like a Grignard reagent, as we've seen from the previous chapters, the Grignard reagent will react with an ester at the carbonyl carbon, right? And it will react to break the CO double bond. And in this case, you know it will reform and kick off this group and add a second Grignard reagent. We're going to cover that and go over that again in a, in a few minutes. 
Um, a Grignard reagent is, is quite reactive. Very strong, very good nucleophile. Um, but some of these carboxylic acid derivatives are reactive enough that you don't need to have a strong nucleophile. You can have a weak nucleophile. So, for example, these acid chlorides are really reactive electrophiles because the electronegative nature of the chlorine is pulling uh, is a good electron withdrawing group as well as the carbonyl group is polarized towards the oxygen. So that carbonyl carbon is quite reactive towards even relatively weak nucleophiles. As a matter of fact, acid chlorides will react with water, what we call a hydrolysis. The product of that would be the carboxylic acid, and the byproduct would be HCl. Um, water is not a very strong nucleophile, right? It's neutral, um, but the acid is, is uh, reactive enough. The acid chloride is reactive enough. It'll react pretty readily with water. Um, as are anhydrides, they're less reactive than acid chlorides, but they're reactive that we can use them to introduce all kinds of different functional groups. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the nice thing about this is that we can take these more reactive carboxylic acid derivatives and easily make from them the less reactive uh, functional groups. So if I take the acid chloride and react it with ammonia, NH3, we actually form an amide. In this process, um, what's departing from the carboxylic acid functional group? Uh, we have some kind of leaving group. In this case, with an acid chloride, Cl- is a leaving group. Okay, so in the hydrolysis reaction I just mentioned, we've done a substitution of the chlorine for an OH to make the acid, carboxylic acid. Or in this case, if we substitute the chlorine for an NH2 group, uh, we've, we've done a a, a, a nucleophilic substitution. Um, and since this is a nucleophilic substitution on a, not on an sp3 carbon, but on an sp2 hybridized acyl carbon, an acyl group, this is referred to as a nucleophilic uh, acyl substitution reaction. Okay, so in a general uh, principle of this, is that these derivatives have a reactive carbonyl group, uh, but they also have a good leaving group. And I've just been, I've just used generically Y in this illustration. So nucleophile will react at the carbonyl carbon uh, to break the CO double bond initially, and then you form the O minus uh, nucleophile. And then what happens is the leaving group leaves. Okay, and in that process, the negative charge comes down and reforms the carbon-oxygen uh, double bond. Okay, that pi bond reforms. That is the substitution of Y for whatever we've substituted it with, the nucleophile. Okay, we know if that nucleophile is strong enough, it can go further. So if it's a Grignard reagent, it'll add again, right? We make this product, you'll add a second Grignard reagent. Or if we use lithium aluminum hydride, it'll add again and add a second H minus. But many of these weak nucleophiles won't. They'll stop here. Uh, especially if we go from a more reactive carboxylic acid derivative and prepare a less reactive derivative from it. Okay, so this is actually a really general uh, kind of reaction um, that we can use to prepare all kinds of derivatives. Now, these are very useful synthetic intermediates, these acid chlorides and anhydrides, because they allow us to prepare lots of the other stable functional groups that we use for materials and for um, drug molecules and biomolecules. Um, but we need to have a way to get to these reactive species. 
So, and that's a good question. I, I said at the beginning, uh, carboxylic acid is acidic, and so its main reactivity is reacting with that OH group, right, the proton. So that begs the question, how do we generate these reactive species so that we can do this kind of substitution to make things we want to make? Um, well, in some ways, we can always start from the most reactive group. Oops, let me back up here. The most reactive group and make weaker ones. So we can actually make anhydrides by substitution from the acid chloride. We can simply add, say, the, uh, the acetate salt or the uh, carboxylate salt. It's a relatively weak nucleophile, but that will substitute that group for the chlorine. Okay, it's a lot harder to go the other way. It's, it's not possible to go directly from the less reactive to the more reactive. Okay, no good way to do that. Uh, that's why I kind of step this down in terms of reactivity. You can take the acid chloride and generate a more stable ester. If we just simply add an alcohol to that, you'll replace chlorine with the alcohol. Okay, so we get now an ester functional group. It's not possible to go back words from that. But we could do the same thing. Uh, we could start with the anhydride and get to that too, because the anhydride is more reactive than the ester. Uh, acid chloride, as I said, uh, by adding ammonia, we could get to the amide functional group. You could do that from the anhydride as well. Uh, as I said, those two are probably the most sort of uh, useful reactive carboxylic acid groups. You can go from the ester to the amide because it is a, a little less stable and a little more stable. Um, but it's actually, that's kind of difficult because esters are pretty stable molecules. It generally requires a lot of heat. But if you do heat this up with ammonia, you could drive that reaction and make amides from esters. Um, yeah, what else did I want to mention about this? All of these, uh, so actually we're going to come to it in a little bit. Making esters and then doing reactions of esters, there's some other ways we can do this under acid catalysis as well. Uh, all of these we can make the carboxylic acids from by adding water. Some of these require catalysts and some don't. So the acid chloride, you don't really need a catalyst. And hydrides, um, you can generally do this with water. But if you want to do this with esters, you need to have either an acid or base catalyst. And the same thing with the amide. The amide is really stable. This is quite difficult to do. So you need kind of strong base or strong acid conditions. And probably lots of heat. But they can all, oops, sorry, that's not chloride. That should be OH. They can all be, quote, hydrolyzed to the carboxylic acid. Okay. So in general, um, probably the most useful are the acid chlorides because we can we can make any of the other derivatives from them, uh, and we can do all kinds of things. So here's some kind of a list of all uh, the sort of main types of reactions. What I listed at the top, um, those three reactions here. Nucleophilic acyl substitution, where we're making, a, again, a carboxylic acid derivative that uh, doesn't, do, doesn't add a second thing. So as I said, we can hydrolyze it with water. We can take these derivatives, add water, and get the carboxylic acid. If we add alcohol instead of water, we make the ester. And if we add amine compounds, nitrogen compounds, we make the amides. Um, there's a lot of subtle, slight subtle differences in here, which I'm not going to worry uh, about too much. But notice the byproduct in all these cases if, we, if we're using neutral nucleophiles in this general reaction where that nucleophile is attached to a hydrogen. 
like HOH or NH2H or ROH. Okay, the byproduct is going to be the leaving group from the acyl chloride or whatever, whatever we have as the leaving group, what I've written Y here, and that proton. And so if you're using acid chlorides, we're always generating HCl as a byproduct. So practically, uh, when we carry out these reactions, we're usually adding some uh, non-nucleophilic base to help neutralize that acid that's being formed to get the reactions to go. Uh, for example, let me see, what do I have on the next slide? Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, for example, if we, if we take uh, this reaction where we add an amine to it, we add ammonia. If we have the acid chloride and ammonia, it's, you know, ammonia can be protonated, right? It's got a lone pair in the presence of HCl. What happens to ammonia? It gets protonated. Um, so as we start generating HCl, before the reaction's done, your ammonia will grab the proton and you'll actually form NH4 Cl minus, so ammonium chloride. When you protonate ammonia, you now have four hydrogens on the nitrogen. There's no free lone pair to act as a nucleophile, right? So at the beginning of the reaction, it's all ammonia and it reacts with the acid chloride. As you start generating HCl, that HCl reacts with ammonia to generate ammonium chloride. So if you have only one equivalent of ammonia, if you had one equivalent of ammonia, at best you'll get the reaction to go to 50% completion, right? At 50% completion, the other 50% of the NH3 you started with is now NH4, as we've generated acid. Um, so that's not very good. Your reaction will stop halfway through. Uh, the way to do that is simply to use two equivalents of ammonia so that you have a full equivalent to, to make 100% of this, and then you'll have another equivalent for the ammonium chloride. That's one example. Um, if you've been reading the chapter and looking at some of these reactions, you might have seen a, uh, some of these reactions have some base added to it. Uh, let me see, maybe I have more room on this next slide. Uh, so if you go, uh, say, from the acid chloride to the alcohol, let's say we want to make the methyl ester. You could add CH3OH, but to neutralize the HCl that's formed, they add a base, typically pyridine. Pyridine has a structure, if you remember from our aromatic chapter, that looks like that. It's a, uh, a six-membered aromatic ring with a nitrogen. Um, what it is, is it's a nitrogen with already three bonds. It's got a lone pair. Uh, it's, a, it's a mild base. It can be protonated, so you can neutralize a strong acid like HCl. So this, uh, you often see things like pyridine added to these reactions. It can't participate in the reaction because it already has three bonds. Um, and there are many, many kinds of these bases, sacrificial bases, that we can use to neutralize the HCl byproduct. So uh, if, it's a, if it's a reaction we're doing with ammonia, we can simply use two equivalents of it. If we want to make an amide, from some really expensive amine, we don't want to waste a full equivalent of it, right? So then we can use one equivalent plus one equivalent of pyridine. Pyridine will be the sacrificial base, and the more expensive nitrogen compound can make our amide. So those are some of the strategies that we utilize to get these reactions to proceed. Okay, so in general, we can do these kinds of reactions. Um, uh, keeping in mind that we often add a base to neutralize the acid generated in those processes. Uh, and 
the hydrolysis or adding alcohol to make an ester, alcoholysis or aminolysis reactions, we can do pretty, really readily from acid chlorides and then hydrides. Uh, the other kind of reaction, as we've talked about many times now, are the additions of these stronger nucleophiles like lithium aluminum hydride that will add It'll do the nucleophilic acyl substitution, but then the product is still reactive to the nucleophile. So in this case, we can reduce it adding two hydrogens. Or if you have a Grignard reagent, it'll add one Grignard reagent. The first reaction is the nucleophilic acyl substitution. This for the nucleophile, which happens to be a carbon minus. Uh, but then this is still reactive, so the Grignard reagent will react again. Oops, that's not right. Okay, so keep in mind, it does depend on the kind of nucleophile we're adding. Okay, so if acid chlorides are some of the best electrophiles to prepare all these different carboxylic acid derivatives, we have to have a way to make them. Uh, and if you think about doing direct substitution of OH groups, that's not really possible. So the question then is, how do we convert the carboxylic acid to an acid chloride? Um, less reactive, OH is a terrible leaving group. The hydrogen is, is quite acidic. So we can't do any kind of direct substitution because Cl- won't add to that carbonyl carbon. Okay, so we need to, what we need to do, if, if you recall from the alcohols chapter, we did have a way to do this substitution, right? An OH group is a terrible leaving group, but we did, did have a way uh, to change the OH to something else to make it a better group to come off, and then add chloride as a nucleophile. Do you remember what that reagent is? We had it on our last exam. SOCl2. Um, that works because, if you re remember, it, it um, replaced the, it put in, uh, let me just draw this intermediate. It made an OS bond and now made a formal plus charge on the oxygen. Now that really weakens this, this uh, carbon-oxygen bond. So Cl- can then be a good nucleophile to substitute, and you end up making HCl, SO2, and then the chloride. Okay, well we can do that with an alcohol, which is on an sp3 carbon. Uh, we should be able to do the same thing um, with a carboxylic acid. As a matter of fact, the electrophilic nature of this carbon, of the alcohol activated in this way, is strong and is good enough to react with chloride, that should be even more electrophilic if we do it with the acid because we have the additional CO double bond. So in fact, what, uh, what happens is we can use SOCl2, it reacts with the sulfur in the exact same way. Now what have we done? We've changed OH We've changed the OH now into a really good leaving group. With a full plus charge on it, the chlorine will readily do the nucleophilic acyl substitution. Chloride will add, and then this will be a good leaving group. This HOSOCl eventually becomes HCl and then SO2. And uh, very nicely, those are both gases and they could be removed from the reaction. 
to uh, push this reaction forward. So this is the way we can make an acid chloride. So carboxylic acid plus thionyl chloride, SOCl2, will generate the acid chloride for us. Um, SOCl2 is a stronger electrophile than the carboxylic acid derivative. Um, so that's why the acid will react with it. This is under acidic conditions. So we don't have to worry about the acid being the proton source because we're generating acid and it's, acid chlorides are stable under acidic conditions. So that's really fortunate. Um, that's a, a nice way then to be able to generate this uh, most reactive of the carboxylic acid derivatives and then we have access to all the other derivatives from that. So we can take the acid to the most reactive one, then we could make esters, we could make uh, anhydrides, we could make amides, uh, anything we want from that. Okay, but there is another way, uh, in those cases we're talking about nucleophilic acyl substitution that's essentially non-reversible reactions. But there is another way under acid-catalyzed conditions that we can make esters. This works really well if you're making esters from alcohols which are cheap and readily abundant, like uh, things that can be used in large excess like the solvent, like in this case methanol, in the presence of an acid catalyst in the carboxylic acid, you can generate the ester. Okay, so the question then would be, how does this reaction happen? Um, and think back to our discussion before of aldehydes and ketones. Acid catalyst plus alcohol. What does that form? That was on the quiz Tuesday. Okay, we can make an, an acetal from that. Uh, or if we have a lot of water present, we could uh, do the reverse in the presence of lots of water, both with acid catalysts. Um, what is the acid doing? What does the acid do in that process? Yeah. Pronate, you, because methanol isn't reactive enough to react with a carbonyl that's neutral. If you protonate it, remember these are all reversible reactions. If you protonate it, now we have a more reactive carbonyl that can react with a weak nucleophile like methanol. Oops. Okay, and I'm not going to go through this whole mechanism, but it's in the, in the previous notes, but recall that we can add methanol, uh, that proton comes off, the proton can go back on the OH, to make H2O come off and add another OCH3, right? Well, the exact similar kind of process can happen directly with the carboxylic acid. Um, in an ad Methanol won't do anything with the carboxylic acid, but if you add an acid catalyst to that, add an acid catalyst to the carboxylic acid, well, the only thing that can happen is Protonation. Again, whenever we talk about any carbonyl derivative, acids, uh, carboxylic acids, 
aldehydes, ketones, when we do these sort of acid catalyzed reactions, all of these are reversible processes. Okay, so if you put a proton on the carboxylic acid, now it's much more reactive, right? Now it's a carboxylic acid with a plus charge. And again, if you think about that CO double bond, now that CO double bond is really weakened, there's a lot of plus charge character on the carbonyl carbon. Alcohol can add. Okay, that's the alcohol added. Notice now we have broken the CO double bond. The proton from the alcohol, uh, when, we, when we add that alcohol, now it becomes positively charged. We can regenerate our acid catalyst. Proton has been taken off. We, we have generated back our acid catalyst, HA. Okay, HA could protonate the alcohol, oxygen, and go back, or it could protonate one of the OHs. I'll just use uh, this one here. Oh, hard to write on this. Okay, just like when we did the reactions with all the and ketones. Probably at the OH, now it's a H2O plus, which can break easily, right? Lose that water group. I'll just draw that particular resonance form. Of course, if we have the plus charge next to the OH and the OCH3, you can draw resonance forms. And then you take the proton off of the OH, regenerate the acid catalyst, make HA, and you get the ester. I hope you can read that. A minus takes the proton. Form the double bond. So it's a in a sense, what we've done is a nucleophilic acyl substitution of OH for OCH3. But in fact, what we've done overall is replaced a protonated form to lose water. Okay, and that's, this can occur under acid-catalyzed conditions. It works best if you can remove the water that's generated in the reaction because the byproduct here is water, right? Overall, if you remove the water and you have a large excess of alcohol, the reaction shifts to the right. If you take the ester, dissolve it in a lot of water, and add an acid catalyst, the reaction will go to the left. You'll hydrolyze it. Um, but this is an example where we, with these uh, species which are less reactive, we can do catalyzed conditions using acids and and bases and things like that. Okay, um, I think uh, some of the general ideas of protonation, deprotonation, making things more reactive or less reactive is something you should be familiar with. I think if you know the overall process here, um, overall reaction for esterification, you can do that under acidic conditions. Um, so this is, this is one common way, as I said, to make esters that have the alkyl group something simple and small. So typically, this process is used to make 
uh, methyl esters or ethyl esters because methanol and ethanol are readily abundant and cheap. If you want to make uh, an ester from some alcohol which is really expensive and much more complicated, you'd probably want to use an acid chloride and one equivalent of that alcohol with, with some base. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about amides. Um, amide functional groups, uh, also, it's very difficult, although there are industrial processes under high heat and pressure conditions to take amines and react them with acids directly. Uh, what happens typically with amides is, like anything else, you have a carboxylic acid which has an acidic proton, you have a nitrogen compound, which are generally very good bases, relatively good bases, and all you're going to do is form a salt. Okay, you'll just deprotonate to form this. And actually, that's probably an equilibrium too, but it'll lie towards the right side just because of the pKa differences. Um, so how do we make amides is a good question, right? Industrially, it's possible to take acids and amines and heat them up and put them under high pressure. Uh, for example, making nylon, uh, it, one of the industrial processes simply does that. It takes the diamine group and the diacid group and heats it up. And then you form these amide bonds and you form uh, a polymer chain of those amide bonds, et cetera, et cetera. You make long polymers. Okay, but in general, that's not very practical. If you wanted to do it in the laboratory, we don't have the kind of equipment, the high pressure, high heat uh, uh, equipment to be able to do this process. So when we, we want to make amides, we need to make them from more reactive species, namely the acid chlorides. Uh, I think actually in, in a lot of... Um, Organic lab courses, I think you can make nylon using not the adipic acid, but the adip oil chloride. So if you take the diacid chloride and the diamine, actually it's a really cool experiment. What you do is you take, you take a beaker and you put the chloride and you carefully layer on a solution of the amide. And right at the interface, the, the nylon starts forming and you can just take like a a wire hook and grab it and pull it out. And as you pull it out, the nylon forms into these long strands. It's kind of cool. Um, and because these, re these will react very readily at room temperature, it's the acid chloride. So generally to make amides, we want to make the acid chloride. So let's say, for example, oh gosh, we want to make something like this. And how might we make this? Well, if you think about it, here's the amide bond that we're looking at. If we want to make an amide, uh, we need to start with the appropriate amine compound and some reactive carbonyl acid derivative. So the amine compound we want would be that, okay? And the acid portion of that is the two carbon acid. So we could use either the acid chloride or conveniently acetic anhydride works really well because acetate is a completely group. Either one of those, you react with the amine and it will form these amide bonds. Okay, uh, so making the acid chlorides or anhydrides, um, we can do from the carboxylic acid. And that's a pretty good way to do it. Now, I will just point out that uh, if, you, if you go on and learn about other kinds of um, coupling chemistries of acids and amines, there's lots of different reagents that have been developed. 
to take a carboxylic acid and activate it into some kind of derivative. I'll just say Z. Something which makes this a good leaving group. And uh, there are literally dozens and dozens of different ways to do this. And then these can react under, if we need to have slightly different conditions for adding amines, we can make amides. A lot of coupling chemistry to make amide bonds uh, actually uses a lot of these different reagents which have been developed uh, to do this. Um, so there are other ways to activate acids besides thionyl chloride to make the chloride. We could add other groups to do direct substitutions with amines and things like that. Um, but amides are so important, right? Amides are probably one of the most important functional groups. Um, because they are a part of these kinds of carboxylic acid groups. Um, amino acids. We, amino acids are molecules which contain both amine and carboxylic acid functionality. Uh, and most of them, there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of amino acids, but there are essentially 20 main ones uh, that we need uh, for uh, as a large portion of the amino acids in our proteins. Uh, most of them are what we refer to as alpha amino acids. Any idea what the alpha means? Yeah, it's on, it's on the alpha carbon, the first carbon from the carboxylic acid carbon. Remember we talked about unsaturated carbonyls, and I said they were alpha, beta, unsaturated. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, Greek alphabet. So this is the alpha carbon right here, the one adjacent to the carbonyl of the acid. So alpha amino acids, um, they have a nitrogen functionality, which has a lone pair. Uh, they have the acid functionality, which has the acidic proton. Many of them are substituted with a variety of different groups. And most of them are chiral and have a stereogenic center at that point where the nitrogen is attached. Um, and if you just had the pure amino acid, actually what you have uh, is probably this internal salt. The acid is acidic. It's got an acidic proton. The nitrogen is a it has a basic lone pair, and in most of the, car of the amino acids, if you just had the pure amino acid, it, it exists mostly in this ionic form where we have ammonium here and O minus there. So what we refer to as a Zwitter ion, Zwitter ion, meaning both charges. I think that stems from German. <clears throat> Zwitter ion, a molecule overall it's neutral, but internally, it has a plus charge and a minus charge. Uh, and that is an equilibrium. If you add a base to this, you'll deprotonate this, and you'll make the carboxylate amino acid, um, and so on. Uh, so this actually makes the pure amino acids pretty readily soluble in water, because they have these charges, generally. Um, but when we think about the structures of proteins, um, they're made up of, as I said, mostly, there are a few others, but mostly 20 common amino acids. And what we see are the, the main amino acids that make up biological uh, structures um, basically fall into these, mostly these 20 amino acids. There are 15 shown here on this slide. Notice there are some that Who's, who either don't have a side chain, like glycine, um, or just have alkyl groups as side chains, whether it's cyclic or not with the nitrogen. But they all have the common structure, carboxylic acid with the nitrogen on the alpha carbon. So these side chains are rather hydrophobic and greasy. Okay, uh, There are some amino acids which have side chains which have other functionality that's polar, like um, alcohol groups, thiol groups, sulfides, um, even other amides, but are generally neutral. They don't ionize very readily. 
Um, or aromatic groups. There are some amino acids with aromatic groups. Okay. There are some, uh, a few amino acids which have either acidic, additional acidic or basic functional groups. So, uh, oops, that's a typo. That should be aspartic acid. Aspartic acid um, has the amino acid, but the side chain also contains a carboxylic acid group. Same thing with glutamic acid, just a, a longer chain between them. Um, so those are acidic amino acids because you have now two reactive acid functional groups in there, not just one. Okay, and there are some basic amino acids where we have um, the acidic OH group, we have the amine group of the amino acid, which is basic, but there's another basic nitrogen-containing group, whether it's an NH2 or this group or this arginine group. And those tend to have overall basic character. Now, these amino acids, with their different side chains, impart different properties when they're bonded together into polyamides. Uh, and as, as I said, these make up the backbones of proteins. Uh, if you think about an amide bond, um, obviously an amino acid has a nitrogen group and a carboxylic acid group, and so we could form linear chains of polymeric amino acids. And there can be many, many different kinds of combinations. So I've just shown, for example, what we, what we refer to when they're not really, really large, uh, when they're smaller, we refer to it as a peptide. The smallest peptide is just made of two amino acids. Um, so, for example, if you take these two different amino acids, alanine and valine, and you form an amide bond between the nitrogen of one and the carboxylic acid of another, you can form a link between them, and a pretty stable link. Here's the amide linkage, or what's often commonly referred to as a peptide bond. It's an amide. Uh, but notice there are a couple of different ways you could do that, right? Each of those amino acids has both of the functional groups. So in this case, um, if I take the alanine valine dipeptide, uh, notice I, I have a free NH2 on this end and a carboxylic acid on that end. Um, in, the, in the lingo of protein chemistry, this end of the, of the uh, polymeric amino acid chain is referred to as the nitrogen terminus, because that's where the NH2 is. And this is referred to the carbon terminus, where the carboxylic acid is. But you can put this together. Actually, there are two different dipeptides you can make from these two amino acids. You can take the carboxylic acid of the alanine and couple it with the nitrogen of the valine to make this one. Um, if you use the other way around, take the nitrogen of the valine. Oh, did I do that backwards? Oh, no, I didn't. Take the... Um, uh, carboxylic acid of the valine and the nitrogen of the alanine, now you have a different peptide. Okay. We still have an amide linkage, but this, the carbon terminus on the top one has that three carbon isopropyl group, whereas here it's a methyl, and vice versa on the other side on that N terminus. So the way they link together also matters, and this is just a simple two amino acid peptide. Imagine uh, 500 amino acids connected together. All the different possible combinations you could have. Um, so I thought I'd just uh, uh, spend a couple minutes and talk a little bit about protein structure if you're interested. Um, when we think about a long chain of amino acids linked together with amide bonds, they can uh, obviously be different depending on the sequence of amino acids, right, and how they're connected. So that sequence, you know, is what, what amino acid is next to what. That sequence of amino acids is what is referred to as the primary structure of a protein. The primary structure. And as you uh, then 
put these different amino acids together in various uh, orders and arrangements, what that does is it imparts other structure. So you get long chains, and they can coil up in specific ways. They can lay into flat sheets, and they can have other types of structures, which we refer to as the secondary structure. <coughs> secondary structure is a larger structure than just the individual atomic uh, amino acids. Um, and then those groups, you, you can form these different kinds of secondary structures within a protein chain. Then that, those fold up into a larger shape. And that's referred to as the tertiary structure, the overall shape of a protein. And of course, biology is more complicated. Proteins can interact with other proteins, so you would then have protein complexes, which could even have larger uh, structure to it. All of that structure imparts function into different proteins. So a little bit about the amino acid, the amid bond itself. Okay. Um, we talked about the carboxylic acid having uh, polar nature, right? A carboxylic acid has an acidic hydrogen and a basic carbonyl oxygen, so there's a lot of negative charge on the oxygen, and you can have dimers formed from those acids, which increases their boiling points and so on. Well, amides actually do that a little bit better. Nitrogen is a better lone pair donor, so if you think about the resonance form, for an amide, okay. There are two resonance forms, right? They have different energies, so they'll have different contributions to the overall structure. Uh, but an amide. In this, if you think about this resonance form where the charges are separated, nitrogen, since I can donate that lone pair, that's actually a, a fairly good contributor. Um, so there is quite a lot of double bond character. It's not, it's actually an amide, it is something between a single bond and a double bond. If you think about a single bond being able to rotate rapidly, right? A single bond has no restriction and a double bond would be locked. That's why we have cis and trans isomers. Um, well, if you have a weak double bond or some double bond pi character there, um, it depends on how strong that resonance contributor is, what the barrier, the energy barrier to rotating is. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at um, the NMR uh, spectra of this molecule, Dimethyl, I'm sorry, uh, this one in particular shows up really nicely. Dimethyl formamide. What we see by using nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy is those two CHC groups are not the same. They show up as two different signals. That's because the rotation around this bond is really slow. If you think about the resonance structure, You see that one of the CH3s is cis to the O minus, the oxygen, and, and one is trans to the oxygen. So these are different, right? So we actually see this kind of cis and trans isomers of an amide bond. Uh, oftentimes, if we look at room temperature, uh, spectroscopy of these molecules. So this amide bond is slower rotating and has a little bit more rigid structure than other kinds of carboxylic acid derivatives. That actually impacts in protein structure as well. It helps stabilize those protein structures, those larger uh, secondary and tertiary structures, as well as the fact that the oxygen has a lot of negative charge of an amide, and the nitrogen, if you look at that resonance form, those, nitrogen, those hydrogens are somewhat positively charged as well, not as strong as a carboxylic acid, but nitrogens or amides do hydrogen bonding between each other quite strongly. The NH will form a link to the oxygen of another amide carbonyl. And it's because there's a lot of negative charge on the carbonyl. And we see this stabilizing these larger protein structures. 
So here's an example of, uh, uh, the, and this, these structures depend a lot on the amino acid sequence that dictates these structures. This happens to be what we refer to as an alpha helix. Notice the, the helical nature of how a chain of amino acids will, will form these helices, um, which are held together and made more stable by hydrogen bonds. So you notice, look, here's an NH group right there. And then uh, several amino acids away, there's a carbonyl group, and there's an interaction between them. So it holds them together. And when you, it's, it's a weak interaction, but if you add them up all the way down, the overall in energy for those interactions are strong enough to hold this helix in a particular shape. So the nature, the, the uh, polarity and nature of those amid bonds actually help to dictate structure in proteins. Okay? This can occur depending, again, on the side chains of the amino acids, whether they coil into a helix or whether they lay flat. Uh, you can also form hydrogen bond connections in flat sheets, which we refer to as beta sheets. So notice they're not coiled, but two protein, two amino acid segments uh, can interact together with all of these hydrogen bonds and form these sheet like structures. And again, this helps to control overall larger structures of proteins. Um, and these, uh, this happens to be a a picture of hemoglobin, which is a protein which carries oxygen around your blood. Hemoglobin um, has 574 amino acids in its sequence chain. And, and notice it's not just a straight chain. Uh, this is what we refer to as a globular protein because it looks like a, almost like a ball. Um, this picture is all of the amino acids um, you can see all the carbons and all the oxygens and all the nitrogens if you really look carefully at this. Obviously, when we're talking about them and trying to picture these, uh, this picture is really difficult to see, right? So we think about uh, representing them in a little bit better format where we, we don't show the individual atoms, but we represent the secondary structure. So you can see a lot of helices in here. These are portions of that protein chain that are in these helix structures. And then you can see overall how those helix structures aren't just a long, straight helix, right? There are loops. There are loops of amino acids that bend them. So we have multiple helices all forming a larger structure. And if you look at the whole surface of the protein, uh, it looks something like that. So that's the overall shape the tertiary structure of the protein. And that's uh, what uh, the shape of that is how proteins interact with each other. And so we, what we have, um, uh, various kinds of proteins with different functions. So um, for example, proteins which form fibers, which actually have a lot of beta sheets in them. They form fibers and they're insoluble. So collagen in our joints. Um, keratins and things like that, our, our hair, our nails. Um, globular proteins, as I just showed, are like more like balls. And then these proteins do chemistry. Some of them, would, when we refer to an enzyme, it's a protein which is actually has a specific cavity to hold molecules and do certain kinds of chemistry. Everything from, oh, what do we have here? adding water to things, to isomerizing double bonds, um, to oxidizing or reducing different functional groups. Um, so there's a lot of chemistry that proteins do. All made possible by amide carboxylic acid derivatives.